I think children's ministry is harder than what I do. <laughs> It takes so much physical energy. At least here, I don't have to like, tie you around with the toilet paper <laughs> the way they do. Really grateful. I, again, we don't know it because we don't see it. And many times, right now, even children's ministry, Pastor Adrian's over there. And so we don't get to recognize them. So at least these people who are here, can all the people in, involved in children's ministry, preschool ministry, preschool connections, would you all please rise? Please, come on. Don't hesitate. If you serve, please stand up. Stand up. Youth too. Youth too. Yes, yeah, stand up. Stand up. Come on. Stand up. Thank you for loving our kids and discipling them. Thank you so much. Thank you. And they do all this for free. <laughs> So let's recognize them, okay? And especially as you see Pastor Adrian later today. Well, I'm glad to be back here. Um, and when I ever go to another church to uh, learn and to preach, then I see the kingdom of God is far larger, but I am so glad to be here, especially this New Life church plant. Uh, back in New Jersey, it was part of a bigger Korean church, and uh, it was a Korean English ministry. So I saw a sea of Koreans, which was good. And, and I think that type of ministry is needed. But I love this diversity. Uh, it makes me more alive. It, it keeps me from my, well, it tries to keep me from my prejudice. At least it keeps me aware that I am still prejudiced and I must overcome those things. So thank you all. Uh, thank you, God, for this diversity, this gift of diversity that we have. Now, as you know, we're a church plant, so I'm, I'm going to speak to you very directly. So guess, uh, you're going to hear this like you're a member already, all right? So I'm speaking very directly, very upfront with you. Because as I said before, usually church plant starts at a home, and everybody's speaking about the ministry, what our vision is, and until that's been, you know, gelled and, and the c o r e team is developed, then we launch. But we're in between, right? This ministry was here before this church plant. So I'm going to be very forward with you, very upfront. And one of the things, again, uh, one more time I'm going to hit this, the city, all the men's fellowship, right? Exciting. Women's fellowship, that too is exciting. Uh, you want to get into it, then you have to join the city. If you're not in the city, then you're not going to be connected and not know what's going to happen. All right, very simple. Just have to go to uh, newlifetriangle.org. It's in your bulletin, and then you'll see a city banner and join it. And this is where we communicate. Communicate is as, communication is essential, especially to a new organization like us. I want to connect with you guys And I want you to be able to freely share your thoughts and minds. Okay, this is why we want you get, guys to get into the city. Okay? Uh, so please, if you have not, if any one of you sitting here have not been in the city yet, this week, make that commitment. Remember, in this setting, in this church plant, in this size, every one of you is significant. You will help us to grow, or it can be a hindrance. That's how important you guys are. Okay? All right. Are you guys ready to, uh, to go to the Word of God? Continue on our study of Romans. If you could join me, uh, close your eyes. Let's be still and know that God is God. Take a deep breath. God, a humble king. And then breathe out and let go of our pride. Breathe in Christ, a humble Savior. And let go of our pride. And then breathe in the Spirit, our humble counselor. And then breathe out our pride. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. where before we somewhat rushed uh, because we can't spend the whole year in the Romans, in chap- going almost chapter by chapter, here uh, we're going to take it a little bit slower because I feel these practical teachings um, have very direct uh, applications to us as a gospel-sharing community. So chapter 12, verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Okay, I, I want to uh, teach that too. Um, it's a very um, old liturgical response. Uh, this is the word of our Lord. What we're saying is um, we're not here like a literature class. We really believe that this is different. It's not obviously totally unique. It is literature, but the Spirit of God comes in, and when it's people of God open their heart, then it becomes the very Word of God for me today. And so we say, this is the Word of our Lord, and we all say, thanks be to God. And that's your faith, saying, yes, I receive it. Can we try that? This is the Word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right, Tom Shadiak. Anybody heard of Tom Shadiak? Okay, no one. Well, he doesn't really care that much about that. He used to be a big name for people who are in the movie industry. Uh, director, he made some big hits. Muddy Professor, not a big hit. Ace Ventura, big hit. Come on, it was pretty funny. All right. Um, Bruce Almighty, oh, I love that movie. All right. uh, he was very famous, and uh, he, he made it. He made lots of money. He lived in a... An estate that's 17,000 square feet in the midst of a seven-acre lot, so big that deers would visit. It would take about a, a half an hour uh, to give a tour to his visitors. Uh, and of course, to take care of all that, he had a staff, and the, fa- the familiar couturers, right? The chauffeurs, and the, the butlers, the maids. He had all of that. And that slowly came to realize, no, no, the emptiness of excess, the emptiness of excess, that this is all waste, even wrong. And so now, he could give a tour of his house in a, in a single second with one sweep of his arm because it's a thousand square feet mobile home. And it's located in a, a shore of mobile trailer parks in a, uh, California, Paradise Cove, California. And uh, what happened? The question is, how can one leave, leave the mansion for a mobile trailer park home. Well, many things happened. One is, uh, he made a flop. Uh, Evan Almighty. I didn't think it was a flop. I thought it was pretty funny too. But as far as money-wise, it was a flop. And it made him rethink everything that he built his life upon. But of course, uh, he was thinking about that already. The failure just made him face it bluntly. Right? Directly. And, and he gave it all up. And so entertainment actually had a profile on him because they were interested in how, how, how can a person make such a huge shift in behavior? And now when he gets a contract, he doesn't ask for his, the usual $10 million against a 10% gross profit. He asks for what the director's guild mandated minimum income is, $200,000 Plus. And so he says in the incident, he says, Look, if my shift of behavior leads me to be homeless and penniless, it's okay. Because you know, he t- committed to giving the rest to uh, chari- charities. He says, It's okay, just bring it on. Right. Now, $200,000, it probably will not make him homeless, <laughs> but it is a big drop. How? Why? Well, uh, he says it in his own words. He says this uh, When I used to be a famous director, and I used to live in the top of the heap, I thought I was more valuable. But I don't think that anymore. I don't think of myself more highly than I ought. What we just heard. Humility can lead to this courageous simplicity. So before he lived in a mansion, and because he's so big, he continually isolate himself, separate himself from people he doesn't like, people he thinks he is better than. But now he's in a mobile home park. He's part of this really tight-knit, eclectic group. He lives next to a, a policeman, a former surfer, a ro- rock band drummer, and of course, on the shore are those cavorting dolphins. Humility leads to community, real community. Humility is essential, isn't it? Uh, to have a good community, especially if you're going to have a gospel community. 
It, it's so important, and that's why Paul, now he's going to talk about this. See, this gospel creates this new community, and we're going to look at it throughout this whole coming week, uh, this strange new community of Jews and Gentiles coming together, but what's going to make this community uh, strong, the string that's going to bond and, and tie all the fragments of the community is going to be humility. So he teaches humility, and then we're going to look at it, verse 10 and verse 16, he says humility again, honor others, do not be conceited, uh, look, don't look down upon people under who you consider to be lower than you. From verse 10, so three times in just this single chapter, Paul talks about humility. He begins with humility and constantly teaches humility. Humility is essential to a good community, especially to a gospel community. Because we know what the opposite does, right? The arrogance, pride. It it destroys community. The havoc it creates, even at the, the smallest level of community, the family. It's pride, isn't it? How many fights are they in the families simply because of pride? Because the husband thought he's not respected because of some careless word, or the, the woman doesn't feel loved because of a timeless or untimely nod, and then those two now sleep at the edge of the bed, refusing to turn towards each other, simply out of pride. Or a father refusing to see a grandchild because he wasn't invited to the wedding. Or the daughter who doesn't call the mother to seek advice. Or a friendship gone cold because both friends will not call the other person until the other person calls first. Pride destroys community. Even at, at a large level, even at a national level, pride, which could keep all the disparate communities or society locked into the isolation, could unravel a nation. So just recently in New York, George Parker uh, wrote about uh, the Silicon Valley, the tech industry, and the wealth that it has created and the great intention it has, but within it, the way it is also destroying communities, making few richer, the many poorer, and just wiping away the middle class. And so he goes, and and, and it's a large article, long article, and one article he interviews this uh, this entrepreneur who's self-critical to realize what his own tech is, industry is doing. And this entrepreneur says this, in quoting, um, that we believe that actually Facebook can be a panacea for all the wrongs of this world. It's not cynicism, but it's arrogance and ignorance. So we have, they have good intention. And it's not so cynicism that blinds them to actually the very thing that they try to, you know, create and try to uh, uh, fulfill is what they actually destroy. But it's the arrogance and the ignorance that they live with. He also met this one guy who, when Obama came to the Silicon Valley and to his campus, he didn't go. And he asked, why didn't you go to Obama's talk? Because he said, (laughs) uh, because I'm doing more for the good of this world than anyone in the government. That's arrogance. Um, this John Cohen, this one I would like to read to you. He, he's a Sta- Stanford political philosopher, and he's, uh, he's a, who's founded a, a Stanford's program on global justice. And he says this about this arrogance that's in the Silicon Valley tech industry, believing that this, uh, uh, the startup company or the right app is going to solve all the world's issues. He says this, there is this complete horse manure. Okay, I'm making it more PG here, okay? Horse manure attitude. This ridiculous attitude out there that if it's new and different, it must be really good. And there must be some way, new way of solving problems that avoids the old limitations, the roadblocks. And with the susan, okay, a sprinkle of, we're smarter than anybody else. It's total nonsense. But you see, over and over again, what you see is this arrogance. Of course, we're uh, in the cutting edge. We can save the world. If I... That unravels a community at a national level and a community at the smallest level, our family. Humility is important, is essential. So Paul keeps saying, be humble. But frankly, is humility a virtue that we pursue with discipline? Do most of us truly seek out humility? Do we really believe that humility is worth pursuing? There are a couple of things that makes it difficult. And the first thing is this. 
actually, most of us don't really think humility is a virtue. We question it. You know, I know we Christians, you know, we, because of our tradition, we sing of it, we praise of it, but do we really believe humility is a genuine virtue worth pursuing? Now, um, to kind of make ourselves more honest, so when Paul says this to the, the Gentiles and Romans, this is just totally unheard of. They're, they've never heard this. Because in the Roman world, they don't praise humility. They praise power and glory and honor. And this is what their virtues are, the strengths. You know, no Roman gods, whoever, if we have statues to their names, uh, ever had a claim that they were a humble god. It's not a virtue, actually. And so to these Gentiles, he's saying, be humble. You know, to you know, to uh, help us to understand how almost sounding contradictory this must have been, uh, how weird it must have been to the Roman ears, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, you know, he, uh, he's very anti-Christian, and many of his writings, he's just, in his rhetoric, it's all about how he f- felt that Christianity just ruined what was good, which was pagan Roman virtues. What the pagan Roman virtues, good strength, good, the Christianity made into bad evil. And, and what Christianity says is, you know, is good, like weakness and pity and humility, actually that's what really evil is. And so in one of his work, he writes this, he says, what is good? Uh, whatever heightens the feeling of power, the will to power, power in itself in man. What is bad? Anything that, anything that proceeds from weakness. What is happiness? And the, the feeling that the power increases. What is the most harmful than any vice? The active sympathy for the ill-constituted and the weak. Christianity. There's all this talk about pity and humility. That is more dangerous than any vice. And, and he really gets it straight from, of course he puts his own spin on it, from the past pagan virtues. The pagan world did not believe humility was a virtue worth pursuing. Now, Jewish people, there is humility, but it's not the way we as Christians teach humility. See, even in the Jewish world, they said be humble and humble, but it was important that you always humble before those who are above you. So definitely in the Jewish Old Testament, there's a call to be humble before God. It was a humility based on hierarchy. So if you're poor, you're humble to the rich. You know, if you're the subject, then you're humble to the king. But never does it really call for the king to be humble before the subject. Yes, the king should be compassionate and caring, but not humble. So humility is basically then in this world, recognizing your position and accepting it. That's the Jewish world of humility. And so I wonder, I mean, if, even we Christians, uh, rather than seeking this humility that Paul is teaching us and what Christ demonstrates, do we follow the worldly understanding of humility? Or even the more of the Old Testament understanding of humility? Do we really? Like, would any one of us want in our tombstone simply this, he was a humble man? Would you be happy with that? Or she was a woman full of humility? And if that second description sits better with us, it only exposes our sexism and our misunderstanding of humility as weakness. Is that what we want to be known? Don't we we buy into this? Humility as really just knowing your position? So when when a Harvard graduate goes to mission work, then, wow, he's a really humble man. But if a city college boy goes to mission work, then, eh, he can't do anything else. Humility. Okay. That's the first thing, because I don't think we really understand what humility is, and so we question humility, whether it's really a virtue we should pursue. Second thing is this, the very uh, obtainment of humility seems to contradict it, doesn't it? Like, it seems like it's impossible to become humble. In my youth year, I was 11th grade, I remember this vividly because it was so shocking. A 10th grader came to me and sits down and he goes, Hyung, right, older brother, I think I'm the most humble guy in this youth group. And I didn't have the heart with me to say, well, you just lost it. <laughs> it's like to pursue it means to actually lose it, it seems. 
So then we need to have a clear understanding of humility. Right? So then we can understand why it is a virtue worth pursuing, and it is a virtue worth all your energy to pursue. But also to get it, you know, we could be, go, be confident without being arrogant about being humble. In fact, Paul constantly says this, right? If in the, just verse 3, three in one verse, he talks about be of the right mind, right? And the English word translates the same stem word differently, so you don't see it, but four times he talks about phrone, phrone, right? Don't hoop a phrone, but so's phrone, to phrone, so's phrone. So he's like, think, so the, the, of course, the uh, accomplishment of virtue doesn't rely just on thought, but with humility, you really have to have clarity of thought, okay? So that's where we want to start, you know, Humility. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so then, where does humility come from? <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> a mis again. There's a source for it. Paul says here that uh, don't think too highly of yourself. And so then, we think humility must be the opposite. Then think less of yourself. Right? And then, so we think that humility must be something like a low self-esteem. It's not. Humility is not thinking less of oneself, and humility is not. Low self-esteem. And let me be a little more clear why it's not. Because actually, none of us can think less of ourselves. None of us really have low self-esteem. Okay. What are you saying, Pastor Sam? I, I, I know that might sound like a her- heretical, because we live in this society where low self-esteem is sin, and to save a person is to inject you know, high self-esteem. And what I'm saying is I'm just kind of denying low self-esteem. People don't suffer from low self-esteem. Um, because people, we human beings, don't think less of ourselves. We all think highly of ourselves. Right? The, the, the feeling of low self-esteem comes because we think so highly of ourselves, and we think that ideals that I should meet or ideals people that should, should see those things about ourselves, and because people don't see it, we don't like where we are. But the reason why we don't like where we are is because we think highly of ourselves. This is why in U.S., right, this is a kingdom of high self-esteem, right, where 80% of the people think they're smarter than the average person, but we also suffer from the highest, one of the highest rate of depression because we think so much of ourselves and because we don't need it and because people don't help us to get there, we begin to have low self-esteem or the feeling of self-esteem or self-hatred. Do you understand what I'm saying? You see, so then... The, the way out of self-hatred that is to love oneself more. No, no, no. We already love ourselves a lot. Right? The way out of our self-hatred is to know that we are loved irregardless of what we think who we are, our worth. So the, the way out of low self-esteem is not to think highly of yourself, but to have a sound judgment of who you are. A sound judgment of who you are. In other words, seeing yourself in the reality of God. See, this is what I think uh, NIV tr- translates this way, sober judgment, but that's kind of misleading. Right? It might not be the best translation. Um, sober judgment sounds like this. Again, it's, it's, we're still buying into the secular understanding of humility. It's basically, okay, know where you are in this hierarchy. Know your strength, know your weaknesses. Be sober about yourself. So if you're good at something, then be confident and say, I'm good. If you're not good at it, then just be honest and say, I'm not good. And so know yourself. Now, that's a good process. It's an important process once you have it. Right? As a pastor, for me, um, before I got ordained, I had to go through a psychiatrist uh, because you know, it's only crazy people who become pastors, right? So they go to a psychiatrist and I, loads and loads of tests to see if I'm sane enough to not hurt people while I'm doing ministry. Right? And, and so the measurement is important. And after all that measurement, the psychiatrist comes to me and says, you're an extrovert, right? No, I'm an introvert. There's a limit. There's a limit, isn't there? Right? Uh, not, not just that the measurement makes a mistake, but the whole measurement itself is based on the wrong structure, the hierarchy. So what judgment? So Carl Barth at this place, he writes in the commentary in the book of Romans, he says, <clears throat> Uh, It's not to the pagan virtue of sobriety that we here we are exhorted. It's not the pagan virtue of sobriety. Okay, it's not about know yourself, know your weakness, excuse me, strengths and weaknesses, and play to your strength. Be honest. No, it's not about that. It says here, source for a sound judgment. What does that mean? Another understanding of it is this. 
an understanding based on reality, in the harsh, beautiful reality. And Paul talks about faith here, doesn't he? So he's very, being very specific about what the reality is calling us to. Okay, so in other words, if you just start from Romans chapter 12, then you will not understand what Paul is saying. But we already have all of the 11 chapters, right? And if, if you don't know about all the chapters, then you go to our website and listen to sermons, right? <laughs> all of that. And when he says faith, what is this? Faith is a trusting response to a divine reality. And so to have humility, you must have sound judgment. What's sound judgment? To know yourself in this divine reality. And what is that divine reality? The mercy of God. What is the mercy of God? On us human beings who are all dying because of our sins. Remember the connection that Paul makes from sinfulness and death. In all the speaking of the gospel, Paul doesn't bring out hell at all, but he says sin leads to death. So in Paul's understanding, the, re- that the fact that we're all going to die is because we're sinful. That our death is evidence of our sinfulness. And every one of us is in that same predicament. So to have humility means to know that you are going to die. Because we are sinners. In other words, we are nothing. That is the starting of our humility. T.S. Eliot in four quartets in this poem, he says this, he says, uh, uh, the only wisdom we can hope to acquire is humility. Humility is endless. The houses have all gone under the sea. The dancers have all gone under the hill. That is, everything dies. Every human endeavor ends. Every human being goes back to earth. In other words, humility comes from Latin word humilitas, which comes from humus, which means earth. That we're from what? The dust. That ground. That's the ground zero from which this new life of humility can begin. We are all going to die. That equalizes everything. You know, this August, I'm going to become 40. And all this year, I'm trying to come to terms with becoming 40. And I said, it's only a number. It's only a number. But then a few months ago, I hurt my back waking up. (laughs) So I wake up real slowly now, like 10 minutes. What happens is that, like, I realize that this body, the pain that's coming now more frequently, tells me that no matter what I do, so I, I should eat well and I should you know, exercise, but even if I keep it at top level, this body will wear down and eventually shut down. There's a comedian who kind of jokes about this, right? When you're 20 and you sprain your ankle, you go to the doctor, the doctor says, oh, I said you'll be back and you'll be in the basketball court in in a month or two. Oh, that's fine, okay. But if you're 40 and you go with your ankle, he goes, oh, it's because it's worn out. It's like, can I do anything? No, you could take Motrin. Like, but if I take a lot of motion, wouldn't it be bad for my liver? Yeah, so you have to choose bad liver or painful ankle. It's like, that's it? That's all you're going to do? <laughs> to know the mortality of this body that we live in. And so, you know, I, I've been saying to myself, you know, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. But I realize that's really depressing. So I changed it a little bit. I said, right now, I'm still alive. Right now, I'm still alive. And the... Uh, That changes everything. Changes perspective. What someone said doesn't really linger that long. I'm going to die. But now I'm still alive. You have the courage to give things up. To live more simply. The courage to be in a community. So here's the um, advices, right? Um, so practical tips. The first thing is this, right? Your sound mind. What is sound mind? Reality. That reality is this, that we are all going to die. And try that. So next time you see like, your anger rising, and every time your anger is rising, there's always some seed of pride in there, then just say to yourself, I'm going to die. <laughs> and it really lights these things up. I'm alive still. I don't want to spend my energy fighting for this. There's a freedom 
in recognizing that you are a nobody. I mean, literally nothing. Right? So Emily Dickinson also has this poem. I am nobody. Are you nobody too? That makes a pair of us. Don't tell. It's dreary to be somebody. How public like a frog. Always telling your name, live long day, to an admiring bog. It is freeing to be nobody. So we don't have to try, pretend, act. We can receive it all. So humility is a sound mind. Two other places where he gives advice, and we'll go through that. Chapter 12, verse 10. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. And then verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Let's start with that second practice. The first is with our mind, knowing that we are of earth, humus, humility. The second one, verse 16, is about people of low positions and connecting with them. Here's, the fact is this, okay? We live in a world that's, you know, hierarchical society. And so classism, race, and that's the world that we live in. So even within the church, as you walk around the connections group or as you walk around the coffee, there will always be people you feel like you're better than. Okay? Now if you deny it, then you are just going to be lock yourself into illusion. All of us peg each other in some level. Okay, I'm going to befriend this person because I think I can learn. That person, you know, I'll be nice. I have pity, but not really befriend. So there are people you look down upon. Now, the way out of it is to recognize that sinfulness in you and me and then befriend them. Right? It's very simple uh, as far as the, 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 the content of it, hard to practice. But the way to humility, very practical, is whoever you uh, demean or degrade or disrespect, befriend. Befriend. And what happens is, as you befriend them, you realize that, you know, your preconceived notion about you being better, it's all a lie. You realize face to face that this person is as equally worthy as you are. And equally, of course, in need of God. That's what you find. Be friend. So I would encourage you guys to do that. Now, I don't want you to do this. Like, I, want, I don't want you to go down and say, look, Pastor Sam said, you know, practice humility. I've got to find someone who I think I'm better than, and it's you. So I'm going to befriend you. <laughs> like, Not cool. Not cool at all, okay? (laughs) So, um, but, I mean, just be open. And that's why I think this diversity is so important. You know, there's a sense that most churches, they basically gather the people that are similar, okay? A similar ethnic culture, similar class. And the way we kind of, I think too easily condone it is this, because we could only be effective to a certain amount of people. So let's just be honest with that. Okay, okay, you're right. But I want to be behind that notion that we could be effective only with a certain amount of people. That's a target audience because they're similar to us. Behind it is lurking the shadow that maybe there are differences in people that actually pegs people. I believe that a church needs to be open to everyone. And there doesn't need to be a target audience. Um, I, I, okay, again, church plans, I'm going to be very honest, okay? Like, so this ministry starts coming from the Korean-American context, okay? and the economic situation is such that Korean-Americans usually end up owning a business, and we employ, right, Hispanic-Americans. Now, we might think that that's the hierarchy, and so we think that, that we as Korean-Americans, we might disregard or maybe look down upon without thinking about it, these people who we, most of us actually employ. That is something that we must acknowledge and we must change. I know it's a little bit uncomfortable, right? Especially because this church is located in this neighborhood. And if if God says love your neighbors, that means the church has to love its neighbors. And there's a predominant Hispanic American community here. And they should be welcomed as any other person. Friends, uh, if you came to this church to be comfortable, sorry. You could find another church. But if you came here to be uncomfortable, to be challenged, to try to make the kingdom, even a glimpse of it, then come on in. This, we all look down to some people, some type of people. Let's just be honest and confess and then begin to befriend. 
That's a very practical practice of humility. The second one is verse 10, honor others. Okay, so here is the paradox of humility. <clears throat> so strong humility founded on sound mind, because it believes that we are all equal in death and sin before God, and equally need of grace, then actually we, could, we are strong enough to offer unequal treatment. We can actually lift up and exalt other people, lift others up above ourselves. See, the worldly humility, because it believes in hierarchy, it implicitly believes in hierarchy, so to enforce its humility, it has to bring people down. It needs to make sure everybody gets equal chance, equal thing, and everything has to be equal because it starts with the acknowledgement that everybody's unequal. That's a secular humility. So the weak humility is you need to make sure everybody is brought down. But strong humility, the gospel humility, we have the power and freedom to lift others up. Especially because the the reality we are grounded upon is not just death and sin, but the grace of God. The grace of God, who, although we have rebelled against him, would come down to us, humble himself and come down to us. Christ becoming a human being so we can become a children of God. Christ laying down his life because he considered my life more important. We live in the reality of grace. And so strong humility can exalt others. So what if this community right here, New Life, we, um, we seek to honor others, lift up others, Uh, spend our energy that, so that other people could get recognition, that they could use their gifts, be willing to step down, and let other people go up. Wow. That, well, that would be a gospel-sharing community. Here is Christ. Our Christ. So humble that he took his life And he broke it and gave it to you and saying, you are more important.